It is Vikes now. It is March 22nd. I'm here for the Wednesday spot with Josh Fry. Give me an assessment of your week and weekend, sir. It's been good. It's a little bit quieter than it was last week around this time. But, hey, it's a down week. We'll take it here and there when we can get it. But, yeah, let's talk some Vikes. Sure, let's do that. Yeah, and it seems like the second wave of free agency, I can't remember last year, has really been a whimper uh, compared to the absolute just – bonanza that we had last week on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, But yeah, I had a set uh, list of topics, but I'm bringing one to the forefront because yesterday NFL.com, Daniel Jeremiah mock drafted Hendon Hooker to the Vikings. And up until yesterday, any Hendon Hooker Vikings theories were get him in the third round or so, or maybe Quasi trades into the second to make sure he gets his guy. And then today, about 10 minutes before we press the record button, CBS Sports' Chris Trapasso, I think I'm saying that right, has an updated mock draft list. And wouldn't you know it, it's Hendon Hooker to the Vikings at 23. So that's two credible mock draft pundits that are starting to do this. So this is the draft hype machine. I need to know, A, from you, our draft guy, is this real? Are we going to start talking ourselves into Hooker in round one? And B, if it comes to fruition, what are your emotions on April 27th? I it it makes a little, little bit of sense that we're trying to we're starting to do this now because we I mean we hadn't seen Hooker play any football since November. So it kind of makes sense that he fell under the radar a little bit as full season was going on and all these other guys were playing on some of the biggest stages of their lives. Um, I, I'm a little bit confused, um, the Vikings taking him in the first round, because I feel like if they're going to take a QB in the first round, they're going to try to trade up and get one of those top four guys, or just pray that one of them falls to them and to a reasonable spot and maybe something like that and go get them. But I head and hooker in the first round. I'm not super sold on just because you've got the injury that might impact him in training camp, uh, and then he's he's not going to play at all in that rookie season anyway. So I guess that maybe not big of a deal, but he is he's 25. He's going to be 26, 27 by the time he actually gets on the field for the Vikings, which in terms of young quarterbacks, that's a that's a little bit of a dinosaur, <laughs> you know. Um, but I, I I do think I do think that he's a talented guy, though. So if they take him in that first round, I'm not going to be mad about it. I'll be a little bit nervous about what he can actually bring to the table because Tennessee, he had everything that he could have wanted in terms of that offense. They had a decent offensive line. He had some really good wide receivers. He had two really good wide receivers actually in terms of, in terms of being able to throw to, but he played, he played against SEC defenses, he played against some of the better teams in the league. He didn't exactly do that great against uh, some of them, but I, I, it is, it is notable that he actually played in that conference and he has that experience. He's gotten a lot better since his first couple of years in college. So that's, that's the that's the signs of improvement that you want to see out of a quarterback coming into the draft. So if they take him in the first round. I'm not going to poo poo it or anything. I'll be <laughs> Kevin O'Connell's got his guy. He's going to develop him and hopefully it turns into something super awesome and we finally have a franchise quarterback. But I will be a little bit nervous about it. I'll just I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> Is it safe to assume that if Mr. Hooker was 21 years old and didn't have an ACL tear, that he would be a top 10 or top five pick right now? I if he was 21 years old and didn't have an ACL tear I think he would be I think he would be uh I think even if he if he was just same age he didn't have that ACL tear we'd be talking he's a consensus second round pick like top 50 guy no matter what okay um he he was that good last season so I I do think that we'd be talking about him in that range instead of him oh maybe we can go get him in the third round maybe early day three something like that Okay, and then point of order for Viking fans who are just getting used to the Hendon Hooker name and experience. Uh, if he is selected by the Vikings in the first round or the third round, he ain't playing in 2023 because Kirk Cousins is under contract and he won't even be ready. Um, so if the Buccaneers take a flyer on him, he's probably not playing in 2023, which uh, hilariously means, and you said this, if indeed the Vikings somehow get to the postseason in 2024 and Hendon Hooker is the quarterback, in the wild card round, because I'm just assuming the Vikings won't get a first round by, Hinton Hooker would be 27 years old, and he would be the Vikings quarterback of the future, the rookie that they got the year before at age 27. It feels like a very like, oh, well, this is what we have to settle for type of thing. But if the talent's there, the talent's there. 
All right, so you're lukewarm on Hooker in the first round. It sounds like you could really get excited about it if it was a mid-rounder. Um, as last week progressed, especially the day that we last chatted on Friday, we had this pseudo deadline where the Vikings had to do something with Zadarius Smith and Dalvin Cook, especially Zadarius, because otherwise more money guaranteed against the books per that player, Zadarius or Cook. Nothing happened. Nothing happened whatsoever. So what does it mean? Does that mean that Zadarius and Cook are more likely to get traded, more likely to keep playing for the Vikings, or they'll just be released sometime this summer? Well, I do think that the ultimate goal is probably, especially in Zadarius Smith's case, is keep him around at least for this 2023 season. Because, I mean, he was – you can't knock a guy that had 10 sacks last year. And, like, even with that knee injury that – he had he was still getting to the quarterback every once in a while down the stretch of the season so i i do think that they ultimately like they like it was uh, reported they they probably want to keep him around as long as they can so that it probably didn't make a ton of sense for them to move on from him in terms of a cut at least at this point um i know we talked about it a little bit but i i do think if they're going to get rid of him it's got to be via trade um okay. maybe you can get another day two pick out of that and then in terms of cook i think that it's always been a trade. Like they were never going to, they were probably never going to dump him in terms of a, a salary just because they, they, they'd be, they'd be eating a decent bit of money if they did that. But I, I think that especially in the Darius Smith's case, we're looking probably hopefully 2023, he sticks around. And then if Marcus Davenport turns into anything, maybe you extend him and then you can save 20 million against the, against the books. If you cut him next off season rather than this off season, and then you just stick that uh, Marcus Davenport in there, maybe draft another guy in terms uh, to take over a, a backup role, something like that. But I, I think that they're hoping to keep around to Darius Smith, at least for the 2023 season. Maybe they're trying to sneak some sort of deal in for Dalvin cook. Although I don't think a trade looks super likely right now, like we talked about last week. Um, so maybe he's sticking around for 2023 too. And we're just running it back. Yeah. It seems that once we got over the shock of Eric Kendricks, Adam Thielen, Patrick Peterson, and Dalvin Tomlinson, all meaty experienced, expensive names leaving. Then it's just a big run it back party. There's only like five free agents that haven't been resigned. Uh, and I guess we're getting word that Chris Boyd is meeting with the giants uh, since we got on air. Uh, that's the chirp that's going here in the, the group chat. So that's kind of cool. But yeah, Duke Shelley, uh, Chris Boyd. Well, there's a couple others that I'm forgetting uh, that haven't been signed back yet. Chandon Sullivan. Uh, so yeah, other than that, it seems like the team will look somewhat similar. Minus Peterson, Thielen, Kendricks, and Tomlinson, which of course aren't nothing. Uh, another thing since we talked that has occurred is the addition of defensive tackle depth. Um, after we got off air, Dean Lowry was signed the next day. A Packer defector, a six-year-long Packer, is going to presumably play defensive tackle for the Vikings, two-year contract. And then old old faithful Jonathan Bullard is back. So does this mean that in their minds, they've probably checked DT off the, the, the list? Or do you still expect the dude from Pitt, Ryan Breesey, somebody to be in the mix? What What's your state of a, a state of play at defensive tackle? I think if you can go get one of those younger guys in the draft, uh, I I do I, I'd go do it anyway, just because uh, these guys aren't on like super long contracts or anything. I think Bullard's going to be on what a one year deal, and yeah. then Lowry, like you said, is a two year. So I I, I think you if you can still go get one of those guys, go do it, just because you don't have a super set long term plan at that position. But in terms of twenty twenty three. You needed to get at least two. You needed to get one of those guys back, and you needed to go get a free agent addition with just to make up for Delvin Tomlinson leaving. So mm -hmm. hopefully, with Lowry in place, I I feel like Bullard will probably go back to his usual like rotational sure. uh, role that he had for most of his career when he was a journeyman, and then Lowry steps into that starting spot. Just because I I don't I don't think Bullard is necessarily the guy that you want to run out there as that third defensive lineman every single week, like like you've you know, like you've alluded to for most of this offseason. So I think between the trio of uh, Lowry, Harrison Phillips, and Kyrus Tonga, you're pretty much set at the, in terms of a starter. Maybe you go get a couple more guys just to rotate in and out uh, and, and just to just some insurance in case there's some more injuries on the rotation or at that position this season. But I think I think what we're looking at right now is pretty solid. If the Vikings were at 23 and Brian Breesey and the Cansey dude from Pittsburgh were there, are you striking on one of them? And if so, who? I 
think I'd probably lean Brissy right now, just because mm-hmm. I think he's a little bit more polished as a pass rusher uh, from the interior. And we I've talked about this all offseason. I'd rather go if you can get a pass rusher and you've got one guy that's an interior and there's one guy that's an edge. I'm getting the interior guy just because <laughs> it's a lot harder to find those type of players than it is to find an edge rusher, say, in like the third or fourth round of the draft. Um, and Vikings have plenty of depth at edge already. So I think if you can go get one of those guys, I, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one other tidbit was Oli Udo is back at backup tackle. Some thought that because every time he plays at tackle, not a guard, at tackle, he looked great. And so some thought he could be a fringe starter on some tackle needy team. Nope. He's coming back to the Vikings, a 2019 draft pick. A quick hitter on this one. Do you think he starts week one because O'Neal's not ready or do you think O'Neal will be back? I, I feel like things are trending towards O'Neal being back. I think Kevin O'Connell gave a pretty positive update on him a couple weeks ago, if I'm remembering correctly. So I feel like O'Neal will be back. But, hey, if he's not ready to go and, like, maybe he's at 75%, then having Udo there is not a bad option either. So I think that this is another one of those insurance plans, just, just in case that one of these guys goes down again because Lord knows we needed him last year. And they <laughs> stepped up. So I, 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 I'd be I'd – be, I'd be totally fine with Udo stepping in at right tackle if they needed to, at least for a couple of weeks. One of the coolest things that I recall from the 2022 season down the stretch, and this is real in the minutia, is that when Garrett Bradbury went down or even Austin Schlotman after that, then Brian O'Neill or even Derisaw at times, it didn't seem like the offensive line descended to the depths of hell like we used to feel when one guy would go out. And I, I you know, stopped for a second. I was like, oh, this is... When you have an offense first head coach, maybe this is the way the world works where, (laughs) you know, a guy steps up and, you know, first of all, you don't move three other dudes to, you know, compensate for it. You just say, oh, okay, Chris Reed's playing center now. You don't swing him out to tackle and then put Darius on. You don't do weird stuff, kind of how the Zimmer regime did. So it's good to see Udo back with that continuity. we got two more topics, sir. They're both pretty damn juicy. Uh, Adam Thielen went to the Carolina Panthers on Sunday, signed a three-year contract. I think he looked around the lay of the land and said, hmm, there's only one or two teams in the world that don't have a WR1. Let me go join one of them. We thought, probably false, that he would join a contender because that's usually what 30-somethings do at this point in their career. They've got the money banked. They're going to go win championships. So we theorized the Chiefs, the Bills. Nope. He goes to a team that is emphatically not winning a Super Bowl in 2023, no matter how you dress it up. Uh, so what is your reaction to feeling grabbing the money, grabbing the surefire targets instead of going, you know, and uniting with Kansas City? Well, I feel like in terms of what they said at the Pat McAfee show the other day, he probably agree with you on the fact that they can't win a Super Bowl right now. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I, I do think I do think that the I do think that the the money made it made it worth it for him. And like you said, he's he's going to be a WR one there, at least a WR two, um, depending on what they do in the draft this spring. But uh, it's it's a really cool situation, honestly. They got Frank Reich at quarterback or at the head coach, and then Josh McCown, QB coach. So whoever they draft at the number one overall pick is going to be he's going to have plenty of guys with experience around him to sort of sort of get him up to speed. Um, so yeah, it seems like a really cool opportunity for him. Glad he got the money that he was looking for and, uh, yeah, best of luck to him. But whenever they, whenever Minnesota goes to Carolina, we'll be rooting against him, which will be, <laughs> which will be a little bit weird, but yeah, it'll be weird. And on the weird mirror, on the weird meter, uh, him joining the Panthers is weird that he picked them, but I tweeted in the immediacy of that move, like who cares? Like he could have really like yeah. twisted the knife going to the bears or something, or even the Packers. Um, or even NFC teams that we really don't like, like the Eagles or Saints, but the Panthers, we don't have any semblance of rivalry, and it kind of just felt like a nothing burger. Uh, did you agree? Yeah, it kind of yeah, it kind of felt inconsequential. I think he went to he looked at that NFC South, I think, and like that division looks wide open once again this season. So I think if he if there's if there's a team, if there's a division that you can probably go to any one of those four teams and make a case that you can compete it's it's that one so i think signing with the panthers they've got they're gonna have an upstart quarterback and they've got plenty of veterans that they've signed in free agency they've been pretty active so it looks like a promising squad that they're putting together right now so hey maybe they can go maybe they can go win that division and go make a playoff run one thing i'll caution against and i do this on my nfl show that i host with west johnson and jason bull and cody spears is that every year 
we pick out a division and we say this thing is murderer's row. Nobody can get out of it. Like last year was the AFC West <clears throat> and the year before that, Ooh, I don't remember who it was, but every year that division underwhelms. You look up and you're like, God, I thought this division was impossible. And then it kind of sucks. And I think the same can be said for divisions that look like shit on paper is that, you know, you look at the NFC South, you're like, oh, that's just going to be meh. And then usually it, it exceeds expectations and you end up having a team that's 11 and six and one team that's 10 and seven or something. So keep that in mind. The NFC now, NFC South seems like it's stinks per QB one play, but usually uh, when we have these hot takes about a division being the best or the worst, they surprise you. All right. The last topic is one that is a hot button one. Um, and the only reason I'm bringing it up is because Las Vegas, the odds makers, sports books have weighed in and they have placed Lamar Jackson and the Minnesota Vikings as the fourth most likely team to land him this offseason. If this was just a, a talker that is fan-driven, I wouldn't even bring it up on this show. But because Vegas sees a pathway for Lamar Jackson to quarterback the Vikings in 2023, we have to at least acknowledge it. Um because they don't they don't they don't put out odds on whims. They do it, you know, because they want to extract the most amount of dollars possible. So Lo and behold, the Vikings are right there in the mix for Lamar Jackson, at least to compared to what or in considering what odds makers think. Now, to get him, there have to be a trade of two first rounders, whether that's this year's and next year's or something that would be got from a Kirk Cousins deal to the Jets or the Ravens or I guess the Patriots, the only one I could think of. And then you have to pay Jackson 50 million while you pay Jefferson 30 million. And then Jeff or Dara saw next year, 20 million. So there's a lot of financial gymnastics. And then this idea that you have a pass first offense with a quarterback as the head coach and Kevin O'Connell, that would suddenly become a run first offense because you have Lamar Jackson. And to me, it doesn't add up, but I'm not going to ignore it because stranger things have happened. What is your temperature on the Lamar Jackson sweepstakes? Well, I think to get started, I think the thing that you mentioned earlier about a Kirk Cousins trade to the, to the New York Jets, I think that would be just hilarious. They sweep, they sweep, a, they sweep under the rug there and get there between, before Green Bay can trade Aaron Rodgers. That'd be, mm-hmm. that'd be, that'd be perfect. That'd be <laughs> awesome. And then if you go get Lamar, uh, man, I, I, I don't think that that could work out any better if they do that. But uh, in terms of actually the realistic chances that Minnesota lands Lamar Jackson, I, I don't see it just because it feels like they're committed to Kirk Cousins after, especially after that contract restructure it, and they, they're putting all that money into 2024. So if this was next off season, I think there's a lot higher chance of that happening. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about it then. I think, I think they, I think those odds are, are, are realistic, but in terms of right now, I just don't see it. I, I don't think that they want to spend two first rounders in order to get them. If, if they, if they don't need to, if they can go get a quarterback in this draft, like we're talking about with if it's Hendon Hooker or somebody later on in the draft, or maybe they, maybe they trade those two first round picks and go get CJ Stroud or somebody. I don't know, but I, I don't think that they want to spend those two first rounders and, and then have to pay a guy 50 million right away when they can go, when they can pay Kirk cousins, whatever he's going to make in the next, in this season, and then go get his quarterback in one of these next two drafts. So doesn't seem super realistic, but Hey, if they trade Kirk cousins, of the New York jets and beat the and beat the Packers to the punch and then go get him. I'm all for it. It'll be, it'll be, it'll at least be a fun story. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing that I'm trying to reconcile in my mind, cause I think everybody after a day or two, if not in the first two minutes, will get excited about Lamar Jackson because it's a former MVP and Quazy made his splash. But what I don't quite get is that if Justin Jefferson is involved in front office decisions, which it sounds like he is, Lamar Jackson just really throws to a tight end and runs the ball. And so I don't know that Jefferson's workload would be expanded at all with Lamar Jackson. Now, great if the team is 12 and five every year, 13 and four, and Jefferson's getting to the NFC championship or winning Super Bowls. But I don't know that it's a wide receiver's dream to have a run first quarterback who also throws to a tight end ad nauseum. Um, Does that, do you think that Jefferson would be in or out of this sweepstakes? I definitely can see that. I, I would push back a little bit just because Jefferson seems like a dude that he could have three catches, 20 yards, but if the Vikings win a game, he's going to be fine with it. 
So mm-hmm. I do think, I don't think he necessarily wanted it to be that low all the time, but <laughs> if there were a few games here and there where Lamar is just going off, he's got 150 rushing yards, something crazy like that. And he's only been targeted like five, six times. I don't think he'd be super, I don't think he'd be super mad about it. Uh, just from the comments that he said throughout his career about he wants to win. He doesn't care about money, that sort of thing. All that stuff that he said for the past three years now. Um, so I, I'd, I'd push back a little bit on it, but it, it does make sense uh, to some point that if you've got a star wide receiver and you're going to pay him $30 million a year, you probably want to use him <laughs> at least a little bit here and there, you know, but I, I, I do think, I, I don't think he'd be super upset about it, but I don't know if the Vikings would be, if would be willing to pay him then if yeah. they're going to go get a run first QB. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, I guess. Yeah, that's dicey. If indeed it was Jackson plus keeping the gang together, Hawkinson, Jefferson, Derisaw, Brian O'Neill, that's about 57% of the salary cap next year or the year after going right. towards five players on the offensive side of the ball. So we'd kind of just be like, all right, Flores, don't leave and figure out the rest with a bunch of third and fourth rounders, homie. Uh, You you talk about CJ Stroud. I want to offer my holy grail for this Vikings quarterback plan. And you tell me if this is your, your holy grail. So I've, I've come to terms that the cousins uh, I've come to terms with the fact the cousins era is probably winding down. They show up in 2023 and make a run great. You can extend him. Uh, but now is the time to plan for his afterlife. Um, and you have that that luxury right now, whether it's our guy Clayton Toon or it's trading up. So if they trade up, um, the holy grail, and this isn't you know necessarily feasible because you have to wait to see how the board falls. But yesterday, I think uh, was it Thomas Davis who said that the Panthers were gonna surprise us all with the first overall pick. And to me, that sounds like a big billboard for Anthony Richardson uh, because nobody quite has him as the first overall pick. Well, if that happens, Anthony Richardson, almost like Anthony Bennett to the Cavs in the 2013 NBA draft where everybody's like, what? Uh, Yeah, so Anthony Richardson to the Panthers and then Bryce Young to the Texans. And then somehow C.J. Stroud falls down to whatever five or six. And then therefore, Quasi trading to that spot isn't as obscene as like three first rounders for the first pick. That would be my Holy grail that it goes Richardson for some reason, the Panthers Bryce young to Houston, and then Stroud falls a few spots, which means that the price tag wouldn't be quite as gruesome. Is that, is that yours? If we're going to be trading up or do you have something else? Yeah, I think the best case scenario is one of these guys falls. And after the Raiders signed Jimmy G to that three-year deal i think that there's a decent chance that at least one of them falls uh into the middle of the first round here i keep an eye on the tampa bay buccaneers too though uh they might be looking to trade up as well just because they have like no plans at the quarterback spot right now so they could they could be another team i think they're at number 19 right now Mm -hmm. uh in terms of the in terms of the draft order so they wouldn't have to move they'd have to move about the same amount as the vikings but it'd be a little bit less in order to to get one of those picks I don't know if I'd go after six specifically uh, just because that's the Detroit Lions spot. And I don't know how happy they're going to be about trading their pick to, to the Vikings in order to draft a franchise QB. So I'd probably look a little bit lower down the board there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Raiders at seven wouldn't be a bad spot. And that makes a little bit of sense now just because they've got their QB now. Um, and then I even maybe even maybe Chicago at nine because they've already traded down once. And I don't know if they're super sold on Jalen Carter at this point. So maybe they trade down again, get a few more draft picks and just work work on fixing that offensive line and all those holes that they've got on the defensive side too. So you get another two first rounders out of them uh, or out of Minnesota for them. That, that makes sense too. So I'd be looking at probably seven or nine in terms of the, in terms of the spot to draft, but yeah, I I'm totally fine with that. Okay. I think uh, if you get out your draft boards, yours is memorized, but for viewers, I think you probably have to get in front of the Titans if one or two of these guys fall of the big four. So that makes Stroud, sense. Yeah, Stroud, Young, Richardson, Levis. And I mean, and this was all predicated on Quazy and Kevin O'Connell having their guy. We keep talking about go get one of them. I don't think that they're like, well, we'll trade up and get one of those guys. They're they're saying, all right, it's Levis or it's Stroud, the one that we are going to push our chips in. It's just we can't be that specific because we have no clue who they've circled. Uh, So the way that I see it is you have to pretty much get to the Eagles spot if somebody begins to tumble because the Titans, 
you know, Tannehill, basically a, a cousin's clone and not as productive. And Malik Willis is a horror story right now. I think that that might be the spot where you could, you don't have to trade oodles of stuff to get there. Um, if somebody falls, and I'm talking all the way down out of the top 10, who's it going to be? Is it Levis? I think I'd, I'd lean Richard right now, uh, okay. just because everything behind the scenes, it sounds like Levis is a great leader in the locker room. And it feels like NFL GMs pay a lot of, put a lot of stock into a guy like that. That can be a leader right away. Kind of, it's kind of the same sort of deal with how Baker Mayfield ended up going number one back in the day. So over all those other guys. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I think that Levis probably isn't going to escape the top four. Um, I th- he's, he honestly would be if, if can't if the Panthers don't take CJ Stroud, he'd probably be my bet to go number one overall at this oh, point. Oh my goodness! Uh, okay. Just because just because taking that in mind, um, so I I think Richardson would be the guy just because he's super raw. Don't exactly know how he's going to perform at the NFL level. It could go to two completely separate directions at this point. It could be another Malik Willis show, or it could turn into the next Cam Newton or Dante Culpepper or something like that. You know, um, but I do think that if somebody falls out of the top ten, it'll be Richardson. Okay. So your um long story short, because I walked you all around there, would your trade up utopia be for Stroud at six or seven, or who would it be? I I lean towards Stroud just because I think he can do a lot of the same sort of things that Kirk Cousins does. And mm-hmm. he's gonna be a third of the price tag for the next four years uh so if you're gonna trade up to get a guy that'd probably be my number one um especially considering bryce young's probably not gonna go past the texans so we're probably pushing that idea out the window (laughs) already um so it'd be it'd be him but again if it if anthony richardson falls to say 12 15 and you you have to move a first round pick to go get him i i i wouldn't be too upset about that either just because of the upside i i think I think he does have a lot of I think he does have a lot of that upside and he's got an extremely strong arm. He's he's got all the traits that you want out of a quarterback. He just hasn't put it all together yet, you know. Yeah. So I I think that if the Vikings gave him a shot, he, it's especially again, we talked about this all offseason. They've got they've got their offensive line figured out. They've got their star wide receiver. They've got their defense on the up. They've got the head coach that they want in terms of offensive presence. He's a former quarterback. So everything is working towards the Vikings drafting a quarterback. And Anthony Richardson would be in the perfect situation for him if the Vikings drafted him, I think. So I'd keep an eye on it. I wouldn't necessarily pick it at this point. But I, again, same sort of deal with the Hennon Hooker thing. I'm not going to be mad if they go get a quarterback this year. Okay. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's really important that Kevin O'Connell is in the room when it happened because he is a quarterback. Oh, was he a third rounder in 2000, blah, 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 eight. Uh, so I think on paper, we got the right guy to do this. And I'll, I'll say it one more time uh, for the viewers that on this show and all the other shows, you're going to hear about the Vikings trading up to get a quarterback. And I'll say it 100 times. It has to be the guy. Uh, so you can take all mm-hmm. of our talkers really and throw them out the window because right now on some, some bulletin board or some iPad, they have, the the one and two that they would trade up and get. And now we just have to spend the next five weeks figuring out who it is. All right, sir. This was a long one. We covered a lot of good stuff. I'm not sure what we'll have in front of us next Wednesday. If it'll be like a OBJ signing or just more depth pieces to fill out the roster, but regardless, we appreciate your time and we'll be back in one week. All right, man. Take good, it man. easy. See ya.